Hi, welcome back to this uh, restoration project, the Schaub Lorenz Goldie 58 Type 3020. What a mouthful. This is a very small radio with a very big name. Well, what you have before you is a result of me getting carried away. And when I say I got carried away, this is what I mean. I was supposed to just check it to get this thing ready for power up. But as you can see, there's a hell of a lot of painting on here. And this is all the, uh, these are all the components that have been checked. The blue ones, all the ones that have been swapped. And it even goes on back to the RF stage. And I'll tell you what happens here. I, um, this resistor that burnt out, this resistor was actually that resistor over there. Now that resistor is a 4 watt resistor. And according to the schematics, this thing is supposed to have 285 volts over there and 220 volts over there. So what that tells us is that between that point there and that point there, there's a voltage drop of 65 volts. Now, 65 volts on 1.5 across 1.5 kilo ohm resistor represents damn close to 3 watts of power. V squared over R. So that comes to 2.8 something watts of power, which is quite a bit of power. It's, it's, you need a, a beefy resistor over there. Nothing too dramatic, but you need something that can handle the heat. Now, here's the problem. If this resistor burnt out, and it's supposed to be a 4 watt resistor, that's it over there, it could have burnt out for various reasons, and one of them is that it could have actually had excessive uh, current draw through there. So how much current would be necessary for 4 watts to be dissipated across that resistor? Well, if you do the math, for this thing to reach 4 watts, you'd need about 50 milliamps across there. And as it's set there, 65 volt drop across 1.5K, you should have a maximum of 43 milliamps. Now, the difference is uh, 8 milliamps. It doesn't seem much, but if you consider these uh, components over here, these tubes on this end actually draw very little current, an extra 8 milliamps does make a difference. So that told me that something in the biasing might be wrong. One of the resistors might be blown, or they might have been um, off spec. The other thing that could have happened is that the capacitors that um, are uh, coupling the signal through could be leaking too dramatically and messing up the bias. So this thing here, these circuits back here, could have been drawing an excessive amount of, uh, of current. If they were drawing an excessive amount of current, and I put another resistor in there, whatever's drawing too much current over here could still be drawing too much current over here. So what I decided to do before powering it on with the tubes in place is actually replace the coupling capacitors. Now there are a few and you can see which ones are the ones that are going to send DC from any of the uh, plate circuits to the grid circuits of the next tube. So in checking those capacitors, obviously the resistors is right in front of your nose. You don't uh, ignore them. So I started checking them. In checking them, more capacitors come up. So the result is I decided to go through the whole thing and do as much of the uh, capacitor replacements as I think I need to. And the result is this little pile over here. There are two electrolytics in here. That one there, the gray one, is the uh, cathode bypass capacitor. It's a uh, 50 microfarad, 12 volt. That thing was reading something like 120 microfarads, so I just decided to swap it out. This one over here, is one of the filter capacitors and this filter capacitor is a 2 microfarad 385 volts which normally I would reform and I try to reform it but the result was I couldn't get this thing to reform there was a leakage of about 4 milliamps um, at something like 150 volts so I dropped it down dropped the voltage down got it to the point where there was 2 milliamps leakage and left it overnight and the next morning there was still too many amp leakage. So that is an example of where you cannot reform that capacitor. So I swapped that out. I actually put in a 10 microfarad capacitor, 450 volts in the same place. 
Its role is to filter part of the B plus further along the uh, back into the circuit. So more filtering, the better. The other electrolytic that I did not swap out is actually the ratio capacitor, that one there. That's an electrolytic that is wired backwards, if you recall. That is the uh, part of the ratio detector in the FM. That one was perfectly fine in all regards. No leakage. The value is fine. It's a 3 microfarad. It was reading 3.1, 3.2. And also the uh, ESR is very low. So that was left in place. And the rest was swapped out. And I found all these guys, with the exception of these two over here, these two little, these things have been swapped out already. This is not original, these two. But all the others were leaking very badly. So now what we have is we have the radio basically restored in terms of capacitors and checked in terms of values. Now the other thing is that, as I hoped, when I saw the resistors in here, I said it reminded me of the Gretz resistors that hold their value very, very well. Well, they're the same resistors. These things were spot on most of, most of the time and, you know, off by less than 1% in some cases, in most cases. So I didn't have to swap out not, not even one resistor, which was a good thing. So I'll show you the underside and show you what I've done. Here's the looking at the side on and you'll notice for a change that you don't see any massive yellow blobs everywhere. I changed, I swapped over to these resistors. These are Shikon polypropylene 630 volts. They actually look better in the radio. They look more period. They look like they belong there. So, you know, a couple of big ones. Most of them are small. They've all been swapped out. Um, that electrolytic, that's the 10 microfarad electrolytic filter cap that I swapped out. There you can see a few more. Here's another one there. There's a couple down there. These down there were actually very tight fit. And with these new ones in place, they fit a lot better. There's another little guy over the top there. Um, there's one behind there. There's a Wimmer, which is uh, in terms of value, that's the only one I had. It's actually actually too good a capacitor to put in here, but that's fine. Um, this here is that uh, bypass, the cathode bypass capacitor. I like to put them in the shrink so you don't see a very modern capacitor sitting there. And uh, also, this was not an axial capacitor, so it helps me to hide the fact that um, I've made it axial. Um, and that there is the, the one that I left in. That electrolytic down there is the one that was fine. So all these capacitors have been checked. They've all been swapped out. Some of these, some of the this polyester or something, and some of the others that normally don't go wrong. I have marked them as checked in terms of connectivity, but not in terms of value, uh, because I don't want to desolder some of those and uh, risk damage. They normally hold their value well. So the reason for this is twofold. One, it was convenient to do a lot of this work before even powering up. And the reason I don't want to go any further is because I do want to power it up, because there's nothing that creates more anxiety than knowing that you're working on this thing and it might not switch on. Right, just before I do that, there's something I want to show you. This is a 10 nanofarad, 250 volt Eero cap. It's one of the capacitors you swap practically always. Looks pretty normal, except it has another lead. This one, um, I've come across these before. So you basically have three leads and you may think that it's a dual capacitor. I've seen some of these that are in fact dual capacitors. There are two in one with a common lead at the end there. Um, this one is not a dual capacitor and I'll show you how you know that. If you look there, you see a capacitor and you see a dashed line across it with a ground. That shows you that this is actually a capacitor with a shield on it. And that shield is grounded. And that obviously is to prevent noise. This is coming out, out there to, this is actually from the wiper of the, uh, of the volume pot. And you don't want noise to be picked up in that line. And that line happens to be partly um, shielded cable, but partly the actual component lead. So 
they actually make a capacitor that has a shield over it and that shield comes out as another connector that you that you connect to ground there's another one here you see that coming into the volume pot as well so there were two capacitors like that because you can't really find those not that i know of anyway i made one and it's very easy to make and it looks a little bit weird but that's it there that component over there there's the one lead there is the other lead going to the pot down at the bottom and this is the ground lead at the top and all i do here is i take one of those normal yellow caps i put some screen some uh, heat shrink on the leads before doing anything else then i wrap it with aluminium um, it's a tape an aluminium tape i wrap that with aluminium tape i wrap a wire around that's why you see that ridge i wrap a wire just normal wire you know something like this 0.6 millimeter wire silver wire wrap it around bring it out at one end as another lead and then i put heat shrink on the top now what this does is the uh, aluminium foil creates a shield and that wire wrapped around that aluminium foil creates the connector for the foil to ground and then with the heat shrink on top it just keeps it all together so there's actually there are actually two of them one is here and one is down on the other part of the circuit um actually it gets you a bit stumped first because when you see something like this you, you know you expect to see a dual capacitor or um you know something unusual but the other thing is what you can also do is um, if you actually measure this you will measure a capacitor value between two of the leads and you'll actually me measure another capacitance between the one lead and the other lead which will be very very low in the order of i believe it's about 20 picofarads and that is in effect the capacitance between the internal winding of the capacitor that you have access to through there and the outside shield that is actually forming a capacitor that's basically the principle of a capacitor is two plates wrapped around each other so i measured 36 picofarads here and when i built that one i measured something like 29 so it does work out pretty much the same and i hope it does the job so now i want to turn this around i want to power this up i want to hear some music hopefully right so here we go again i have the radio off i have an external antenna into the fm line and i have an external antenna into the am line i've got the radio connected into the light dimmer limiter i have it on but i have the radio off so i am going to hit let's try medium wave see what happens to the lights one two three right went on very bright drop down current increased and then drop that's normal it should start increasing again as the as the tubes start conducting got the volume ah i hear some hum there it is it's increasing the current draw we've got some hum well not really hum just a crackle something there let me give it one more light so we're up to 209 volts 140 milliamps do i hear anything ah something hey it's making the right noises all i can hear is a crackle volume pots a bit dirty it's trying to pick up something okay that's trying let's try sh short wave
something there, very, very faint. There's something there, it's picking up something. Very, very, very poor sensitivity. Oh dear, not good so far. Right, let's try FM. Oi. Okay, that's loud. Ah! Something wrong with the spot. Oh yeah. Something wrong with the pot. But it's certainly receiving. Ah, good. Try the bass. Yeah, treble. Brilliant, we've got FM. Okay. That makes me feel better. Something wrong with the spot, watch. That's not doing it, but... Okay, enough for now. So what do we have? We've got no shorts, we've got the radio working to a degree, FM seems very lively, so I'm happy with that. The AM is very, very faint. It's there, it's picking something up, but very, very faint, and I'm wondering if it's... Uh, it's os so the oscillator is working because we are tuning. I've got to check that IF amp, but the IF amp would have, that EC, uh, EF89, if that was defective, it wouldn't allow the FM through. The ECH81, if that was defective, that wouldn't allow the FM through. The other part has to do, it's a mixer and it's got the, um, the, the, the triad works as the oscillator amp. So maybe that's not working too well, but it is tuning. Okay. The preamp must be working because that's preamplifying exactly the same thing for AM and FM. So the other thing that could be is the front end or the IFs. So I'm going to do some thinking, do some checking. I'll check some of the components and connectors and connections that I haven't checked so far. Make sure the antenna signal's going in right and everything else. And then I'm going to probably go for an IF alignment, at least of the AM, because I think that might be our problem. Someone might have tweaked those, uh, the IF transformers. Right, but at least this thing's working. This is great. This is great. This was not all for naught. Um, it's a nice, compact little radio. It's going to be the smallest radio I'll own for a change. Something small, something you can just use anywhere, unlike some of the other beasts that i got lying around. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty chuffed. I'm pretty chuffed. Also, the dial cord after I, of the FM, after I oiled some of the connections here, some of the contact points and the, um, all these points where some stress would be placed on the cord, it's now not slipping anymore. At least so far, it doesn't seem to be slipping. It seems to be working quite well. Right. Okay. Time for some thinking. Bye for now.